Greetings. Welcome to In Conversation with Trevor, brought to you by Heart and Soul Broadcasting Services. I go beyond the headlines and beyond the sensational. Today I'm in conversation with Robert Howard Chapman, the presidential candidate for the Democratic Union of Zimbabwe. If you enjoy this conversation, remember to subscribe, like, and share. Robert Howard Chapman, presidential candidate for the Democratic Union of Zimbabwe. Welcome to In Conversation with Trevor. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm very uh, humbled to be here. Why are you doing this? <laughs> right to the point. Before, before you do that, Robert, I'm going to be candid with our viewers who are out there. That I, as I sit here, I'm not inclined to vote in 2023 because I'm not persuaded by the options that we have at the present moment. So I'm hoping that after this conversation, you're either going to make me want to go and vote and vote for you, um, or I'm going to stay home and do nothing. <laughs> because right now, the choices we have have not a choice. Yeah. So Robert, back to my question. Why are you doing this crazy thing? You know, it's an interesting segue. And first, let me say thank you for having me. I watch your show. You've interviewed a lot of big names. I'm very privileged and honored to be here. And thank you for having me and the, taking the time. You know, that question is a very big question, but it actually, you've sort of answered it. You know, we looked at data and we, let me start with the, where we are now and sort of go back a little bit and then start from the, from the beginning. But right now, there are more people that feel the same way you feel uh, about the options that exist, the direction of the country, Will there be real change? And if there is, will the people really stick to what they say they're going to do? Do they maintain integrity uh, when they uh, get into public office and are uh, supposed to serve the people? And that group of what we essentially is called voter apathy of people that have sort of thrown their hands up and said, you know, I think I'm just going to keep my life private, stay out of, that, uh, out of the, those circles that seem to be more polarized, more toxic. Uh, we exist for that group. Um, there is convincing to be done but I don't believe, and we don't believe, that it, it takes a lot to do so. Because the evidence around us in our community, in our society, is showing us that it's not working, hasn't been working, and we don't really have faith in, in that the candidates that exist today can really deliver that change, because some of them have been in for a long time. So going back to how this really started, you know, I grew up in Chinoy, grew up in a you know, very poor, uh, poor uh, upbringing, very difficult upbringing, and I was very fortunate to be pulled out of education. And you know, just like most Zimbabweans, they have another Zimbabwean family that lives uh, overseas. I was able to do that. I was pulled out of, in fact, all of us in our generation, my family, we were all pulled uh, out of the country by extended relatives from our, our Zimbabwean family to uh, either study university or when you finished here, you're able to try and get a job to try and make things better. And so I got to be able to, I was able to see that, but work ethic was always inside my, my blood and my, uh, and my upbringing. So when I went to those societies, I was able to quickly succeed and progress. So as I started coming back to, to Zimbabwe, particularly around <clears throat> the 2014 timeframe and started coming back in, I didn't really see much of an improvement uh, at all. In fact, things were really deteriorating. Around 2016, 2017, I started trying to approach, um, the progressive part of our country from the private sector standpoint. You know, how could we do some projects? Could we get business, some businesses off the ground? What would that look like? Was the environment there? Even if it was tricky, as a Zimbabwean, I felt I had an advantage over maybe other foreign potential investors. You know, I, I could call an uncle, I could call an aunt, I could make something happen locally. It just wasn't working. And the more frustrated I got, the more questions I started asking. And it came back to this issue of, of politics was not right. The environment was not right. There was corruption. You couldn't trust what was taking place. You couldn't even trust if you started a business, it was successful, that you would still keep it. You couldn't even trust putting money in a bank. You know, so... Any specific um, project, um, Robert, <laughs> that you've worked on, that you tried to, 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 to have uh, invest in Zimbabwe that didn't work? Any specific ones so that people 
have stuff to, 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 to put their fingers on. Yes, in fact, several. Uh, we actually, um, man, there's, uh, there's so many of them uh, that we brought. In fact, we actually created a sort of a two-page portfolio where we came and met with several entities. One is we looked at university student housing, specifically at Chinoy High School as being the first option. We even did the designs for it and presented it. Uh, one of the reasons that didn't work is our youth don't have jobs. So if we were to put them in accommodation to pay for them, how would they pay for them? You know, how would we be able to get return investment on, on being able to build this facility? The management of that facility is one. Could we tie it to grades if the place was vandalized or parties were going on? And that dynamic, including, you know, a, a public sector entity, not necessarily Chinoy, Chinoy um, uh, Cut, uh, Chinoy University. University. Yes, not necessarily them, but the governing entity was the way the trick was uh, for us to get that done. We looked at solar energy. Uh, so it didn't get done. No, we couldn't get. Somebody done. stood in the way. Yes. In, in the, in what the, exactly happened? Do you remember? I do. Um, you know, I'm going to be very um, candid. Very, very, very come diplomatic. Come on, come on. Give, us, <laughs> give it to us. You are a presidential candidate. I am. So let's go there. Very diplomatic. Yeah. Um, there were some things, you know, some things asked of us that we just couldn't, we couldn't agree to, okay. to do, to get that done. And then the other side was uh, was energy. We actually came in and said hey, we can uh, put together a project. And we really went as, as far as we could to get a uh, solar project off the ground. And, um, it, and our first project was going to be 100 megawatts. And we, you cannot discuss economic development without addressing energy shortage. And that didn't happen because? Didn't happen. The ability to repay. Mm -hmm. So during that time, there's right when the uh, currency flipped. When they changed overnight, we went from US dollar to you know, RTGS. And that deal just fell apart. It was very difficult to convince our developers and our banks to finance that program, considering that our credit rating as a nation at the time was the second lowest credit rating in the world after Venezuela, and we've never been to war. In fact, I remember the banker said, you're better off opening up a coffee shop in Afghanistan than you are uh, you know, trying to get a project of this size financed in Zimbabwe. And I believe they were also being sued by another uh, energy company in Johannesburg for lack of payment. So if you build a project that size, you wanted some sort of guarantee that there was going to be payment and they just couldn't issue it. They couldn't issue the guarantee. So we said, let's table this, we'll come back. So due to that frustration from the private sector, I engaged in some conversations with some colleagues that understood what was happening. And they said, the politics is not right. So the question was, what do we do? So 2018 was right around the corner. So we said, let's wait and see what happens in 2018. Talked to some folks, they said, this thing is definitely going opposition. This thing is moving directly in the, in the direction of opposition. And we could see it in 2018. There was huge momentum. The parties had got together, kept the alliance intact, and they were moving, uh, you know, with, uh, with uh, Chamisa, the tip of the spear. Yeah. And so that didn't happen. You know, whatever, you know, took place, the, some polling stations were not protected. The election was essentially, you know, stolen, or that's the argument. The election was stolen. I wasn't there, so I can't really say. But when we started to see what unfolded after 2018, was started to unfold, we started to see issues around uh, V11 and the court case that was taking place. We started to see separation inside the opposition. And then I started to realize if we don't form something here, we're not going to be left with an opposition. We started to see the same things coming back over the last 10, 15 years, unraveling right in front of us. We're almost re history repeating itself. You know, there's name calling, there's labeling, there's this person's this, this person's that. And we started to see the separation of opposition. And so we started, I started asking some key folks, how do we put this together? How, how does this work? With the intent of me not being the face of it, the idea was, you know, do we find the right candidate and we, and we can help them stand this up? Someone with, you know, tremendous political muscle. Uh, we know the climate of politics here. Someone who's willing to go through, uh, through that, essentially, you know, the V formation, the bird at the front that takes, that, that takes, the, um, that takes the pressure. Uh, and as we started moving through that transition, we found ourselves here. So the first thing we did, I think it was around April uh, 2021, uh, we consulted some, some well-respected individuals uh, in politics and said, how do we fr frame this? They said, you need three things. You need a constitution, you need a code of conduct, and you got to know who you are so people can relate to you. And that's, those are the first three so things we did. How long have you been running now? How long have you, how long have you existed as an entity? 
that wants to win a presidential election? As an entity, I believe we registered officially around the um, April May timeframe. It was official entity with uh, with year. with Zach last year, twenty twenty two. But we had started the process in the background of putting together, uh, you know, teams and looking at what the ground looked like, working through data, uh, because obviously I I mixed race. Uh, I've lived uh, overseas uh, for some time, even though I've been coming back and forth very frequently. We looked at data to say, would it be favorable if, if I ran? You know, what would people accept that? Then the second side of it was to also look and say, was there a window for us to participate in and the upcoming election? And what did the data tell you on, bo on both those two scores? It showed that there, we would be very accepting. That from, Zim from a Zimbabwe standpoint, uh, being uh, my race, being mixed race, uh, you know, my father's white, my mother's black, uh, and so looking at that, that people would be very accepting. There was an opportunity of acceptance. And then the bigger tell, telltale sign was uh, this, this data was prior to uh, the formation of the CCC, showed that there was huge voter apathy. In fact, that group was larger than each of the parties individually. So we knew if we didn't even tap into the, the followers of the other parties, just moving into the center, we would, we would have a very, a, our message would relate with the larger audience than the extremists on each side. Robert, have you not left this thing too late? Great question. No, I think it's a right on time. So we actually had planned on launching right around the, or announcing, I should say, right around the August timeframe. And we didn't. There were some scandals taking place um, in the opposition, and we wanted that to ride out a little bit. So our timing, I think, is perfect. I think we would have rescued some people from, um, uh, from scandals if we had came out in that time frame. And I'm glad we did because right when we went to the press conference is right when this uh, debacle of the 40,000, 300,000, the 500,000 gifts or loans, whatever they, <laughs> they want to call this, had now gone into parliament. And the crazy thing was it was on both sides of the aisle. So when you look at, when you're talking to people and they talk about corruption, and now you're talking saying, we're the alternative. I don't think you are. You now you're eating at the same table. You're eating the same cake, and it was an opportunity right there to really stand above, and really stand with the people and say, "There's no way I can take that, because this country has suffered." As I travel around the country, it is the number one issue is corruption. So you are so confident that this thing is ripe for the taking, that you think the remaining what six nine months will do it? Yes, absolutely. I believe it will. And we, again, we work through data and we work through uh, the, the uh, folks on the ground. Five weeks, and I think for some of us that have had the opportunity to go into other markets and live in, in different areas, you know, five days is a lifetime. Five weeks is a lifetime. Gosh, what, imagine what you could do with five months, mm -hmm. you know. So for us, with the right planning, if you think of, um, you know, sort of like whether you're looking at the uh, Pomodoro effect or the 80-20 rule, you know, our goal is not to focus on the 80% to get 20% to, uh, to get 20% of results. It's to do 20% of the work extremely well to get 80% of the result. So instead of building these big giant um, sort of dreams and, and really going this far direction, we're focused on a, on a very key issues that relate to the people on the ground that they cannot even argue that are happening in, the, in their mind and, or in their, in their communities and really showing them that we can really drive change. We believe that if people want to register to vote uh, is one which I'm going to encourage you to because, you know, you are in that category and there's nothing wrong with being in that category that say, you know what, I don't see a candidate. Mm -hmm. But what I will ask you to do is take the opportunity to register to vote, have an open mind and watch what we're doing, listen to what we're saying, look at our actions and then make a decision. If you decide, hey, you know what, Robert's not the right candidate or my M the MP that's being fielded by DUZ or my counsel is being, uh, uh, being uh, is being um, fielded by Democratic Union of Zimbabwe is not the candidate, then yes, that means we have not done a good job of um, showing you that we or, or presenting to you an opportunity. So Robert, you're saying you're going to focus on the 20% to get the 80%. Correct. Because you're speaking to the issues of those 20% Correct. people. What are these issues that you're speaking about? Oh, wow. So for us, we've got three pillars. And while they seem very simple, they really encompass many parts of people's lives. Prosperity is number one. Our people are broken, they are um, emotionally bankrupted, uh, they're tired, they're exhausted, uh, they're hungry, they're uh, in poverty, in dirt poor poverty uh, throughout this country. They live in mud, the sewage running through the cities. And so prosperity is number one, they have no jobs. Just what yesterday, 
the sugar refinery plant here just shut down. And they call it temporary shutdown, but you and I both know from the business sector that the chance of that standing back up is very slim to none. And 90% of you know, uh, economic structure is based on policy. Mm -hmm. So prosperity is number one, is personal prosperity. Mm -hmm. Number two is justice. Mm -hmm. We don't have a justice system that serves and protects the people and works for the people. Number three is modernization. For me, that's the fun part, is rebuilding our country, but rebuilding it together as Zimbabweans and not allowing other people to come and reshape our country, rebuilding it with the right motive. Mm -hmm. So for us, those three things are the, are the three pillars that we're building on. And that's where that's, that's our offer to the people. Well, what's your infrastructure like? I mean, um, who else is with you? What's your team like? Are you going to be running for council elections? Are you going to be running for uh, parliamentary elections and presidential elections? But in the first instance, what does your team look like? Is it just Robert? No, great and question. And a dog? <laughs> <laughs> no, I miss my dogs too. But um, no, it's not. Uh, not at all. There's a big, big team. As you, as you uh, noted in our prior conversation, you asked me a question. I said, I'm going to have to go talk to the leadership. Mm -hmm. So there's a leadership. There's a council in place, an advisory. Uh, our constitution exists, which means that I don't carry 100% of any decision that takes place. And nor do I want to uh, you know, uh, carry 100% of the decision. Um, That's an African, Robert. <laughs> no, I believe in institution. I really believe in the power of institution. I believe that the state house has to be greater than any occupant that's in the state house. Mm -hmm. It's the only way we can progress. And I believe that the Democratic Union of Zimbabwe has to outlive me, outlive any candidate that exists, and hold accountable uh, candidates. And so, what, what's your what's the team like? And uh, and parliament and council, what's the way forward there? Correct. We are fielding one hundred percent candidates. Okay. Yes, we're fielding one hundred percent candidates, and we have. Um, we have a provincial team and structures in place that at the province level, district level, constituency, in some constituencies we're down to the ward and polling station mm. uh, level. So we've... Uh, as You've we, got this infrastructure, we do. Robert. We do. We, in fact... Uh, why, why don't I believe you? Oh, you should now. Because before, you, all people saw was me, right? There was the brand being built. Yeah. And so, but now we've, we're talking today, right after we've had our Bulawayo uh, meeting structures and we've had Mashingo meeting structures. And it's evident that the, you know each meeting there's four five hundred people four five hundred people. It's evident that there's structures in place. I don't believe the um, our elderly folk, our senior citizens, would attend a meeting because some uh, some guy has come from the United States says he wants to run for president. That means there's been conversation on the ground. Uh, I have visited some of these communities personally prior. Uh, to press conferences and prior to the to the structures meetings now that we have to seek permission for uh, I've already engaged with a lot of these folks and they know who I am either through phone calls. So the team is there Fantastic Robert. We'll take a, a short break here um, Don't go away when we come back. I'm gonna ask Robert the question that some in the opposition are asking has somebody paid Robert <laughs> to run for president? They are alleging that somebody has paid you to run for president. They are alleging that you are a ZANU PF project. Do you have any response to that? Welcome back uh, to our conversation with Robert Howard Chapman, the presidential candidate for the Democratic Union of Zimbabwe. Before we went uh, for the break, I asked, I, I did promise that I was going to ask David, uh, Robert, rather, Robert, Robert, uh, whether he's been paid by somebody to run for president. The opposition, uh, interesting, the, I think your biggest support, uh, attacks are coming from the opposition. Correct. And by the opposition, we're talking of uh, Nelson Chamisa's uh, Citizens Coalition for Change. Mm -hmm. They are alleging that somebody has paid you to run for president. They are alleging that you are a ZANU PF project. Do you have any response to that? You know, I debated on responding to it. Um, but it's very easy because they do this to themselves. They've done this since, since history. So let me answer this straight as, as I can. Uh, I am not paid for by Zano PF. I am not paid for by any ent foreign entity. Uh, I have come from a very comfortable lifestyle, uh, life where I could have just stayed in the shadows. I love private sector because you can succeed and fail privately. Uh, for me to expose my family and myself this way 
this was a personal decision. I don't think there's enough money that someone could pay me to do um, what I'm doing and going through, what we're going, putting my family through what it's going through. Uh, so there's no, there's no one paying me. My job and my goal is to remove Xenopf. I want to make that extremely clear. They wouldn't pay me to do that. <laughs> they wouldn't pay me to, to get anywhere near, near that, uh, that realm. The other side of it, there are individuals that are sanctioned by the United States inside, as, inside the Xenopf government. I don't think I would be smart enough to align myself there and do and participate in this election at the risk of also being put on that sanctions list with illicit. So the issue is the name calling and, and, and the slurs that come out, this is actually what separates the opposition, not unify it. And this has been going on for a long time. In fact, some of their own um, a, a leadership team right now are the same people, they use the same mechanisms to do that. So, you know, I debated on responding, but I didn't want to engage it. My grandfather told me a long time ago, he said, you fight with the pig, you and the pig get dirty and the pig likes it. So I chose not, not to respond. So the answer, I mean, I'm glad you asked me that question. Very straightforward. Uh, the answer is no. Why didn't you join the Citizen <laughs> Coalition for Change to get rid of uh, Zanapier? You know, we, our constitution's older than their, than their political formation. And so we had actually been looking at this long before they had actually formed. And we did try to make, we did make an attempt to talk with them, not just them, with really with every what we consider progressive opposition to say, we need to go on this together. And how do we do that? We may not agree on certain key fundamentals, but if we find basic principle, what we're trying to accomplish, I think we can get this done. And this is more from the business sector, which you see mergers and acquisitions all the time because they're trying to go after a corner of a certain market. And so I looked at that in politics and say, we're trying to go after something very big, very deep rooted, and we need to, we need to pull this weed out and we need a big machine to do so. Um, ego plays a part in this. Big ego plays a part in this where, you know, are you trying to take a position? Are you trying to do this? Are you trying to do that? And I realized the conversation really was going nowhere. How big is your ego? I think you have to have a big ego to do to do what we're doing. You know, if you're being honest, you have to have a big ego to what we're doing. But for me, in this one here, I think there's more of an emotional call for me that if there was a um, if there was something that was there, and they said, you know, we need, I would step away. If would we, you? I would, I would. This is a hard thing to do uh, to put your family through this. To even you see the attacks, they're racial, they're all sorts of stuff, and it's fine. I I, I can deal with with all these sort of things, but. You know, at some point, my, my family is part of the campaign, too. My family is part of this as well. And we know how politics can get in this country. And that risk is, 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 is always something we keep uh, at front of mind. And I said, I love private sector. But I know that we don't have a solution in this country that is really going to build this country. We don't have it. And so... I, I, lived, in, I lived outside the country for 18 years. Mm -hmm. And... There was a time when I, I, I got the sense that I didn't quite understand the country because I wasn't here all the time. Mm -hmm. I was disconnected uh, somewhat, even as a media person, but uh, I just couldn't keep track. How on top of issues are you when you're coming in and out of the country? How much do you understand the problems that people are experiencing? Oh, very much so. Uh, so coming in and out of the country is not like I'm on holiday. Uh, I'm coming out of the country is uh, very frequent uh, in, in, and being in the community. I've been all over the country. In, just to give you an example, in 2019, I was here six times. In 2020, I was here twice before COVID. And that's only within a six, you know, COVID, most of the lockdowns was, I think, March 10. I've been in the country two, three times already uh, by then as we were looking at how do we start to structure things and really talking to the community, understanding key issues on the ground. Because getting real surveys and real data sometimes can be very tricky. You actually have to go to people. Uh, to get that done. 2021, things started to open up a little bit. We started moving a little bit faster. In 2022, I was here a, tr a tremendous amount. But at that point, because we had officially turned in paperwork, we knew there was a risk of you know, being followed, the risk of uh, you know, surveillance. So we moved a little bit more cautiously. But by then, we had our, our tentacles on the ground. Um, working with uh, civic society organizations, looking at their data, looking at what was taking place. Uh, thank God for people like Hope Ono that really you st stand in the front and put information out there that might be hidden underground. Uh, so, and then to some individual journal journalists that really take risk and, and show what's happening, 
without having to rely on on some you know sort of uh, big media. So I, I believe that I'm really in tune and in touch with what what's happening on the ground and, and talking to people. Being able to talk to them while non politically affiliated was far easier than now, mm. uh, because now they're reserved on giving information because they they're not quite sure how we would use it. But before, if you're talking to someone as an individual and saying how can I help you, they really give you some 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 pretty disturbing facts. But then again, things are so deteriorated, it doesn't take much to walk around and see what's going on. Congratulations, your son turned one, hey? Is yes, it yesterday thank you. or today? Yesterday. Mm -hmm. And twice you've said um, your family is going, has, has been through a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, what is that like, the lot that they've gone through? What is it that they're having to go through because we've made this decision? You know, one is financial. Uh, you know, when, someone, when you ask, did someone pay, is someone pay me? Uh, no, this has been uh, personally, we've, I've been uh, funding this. And of course, when I say personally, that includes my family. That decision is made, made as a family. Um, I grew up without a father, and so fatherhood has been very important to me, and I see my kids as, as much as I can. You know, prior to, you know, doing this in my own uh, private life, I fly about 100 flights a year um, just for work business. So anytime I'm not there, anytime I'm home, I'm always with my family and my kids, turn the cell phone off. But now the distance that's there that's, um, th because of, the, of um, the politics and even sometimes seeing I'm taking late night phone calls, I'm, it's, it's 24 hours a day and I'm talking to different teams, um, this, that time is sort of not there anymore. And we're trying to bridge that with technology, you know, FaceTime, but it's not the same as being one-on-one. -on -one. So missing my son's birthday, you know, yesterday, and um, we knew there was a part where he was gonna start walking and I didn't want to miss that. So I went back home uh, for about two, three weeks and we were really waiting for that. And he really took his first steps while I was there, got wow. to see it. I started, I get emotional Beautiful. talking about this, uh, but um, he turned one yesterday and FaceTimed him. first one? First boy, I've got four girls. I've got four older girls, and he's the uh, he's the first boy. Wow. Yeah, so it was um, you know seeing him yesterday. But I want to really note that my wife has been extremely supportive, uh, absolutely loving. She's not put any pressure she's, she's on me. Zimbabwean. She's not. She's American. She's American. Extremely supportive. Uh, she understands why I'm doing it. She's been to Zimbabwe many times. Her, she said that um, the, her favorite place, she felt closer to God when we watched the sunset in Kariba. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, it was interesting. The beach was empty, uh, the, you know, the pebble beach out there. And we had a glass of wine together. And uh, we saw the sun go down over the mountains and she said, this is the closest I've ever felt to God. So her favorite place is, uh, is Kariba. Uh, so she understands why I'm doing it. Um, she really understands why I'm doing it. She's never uh, put pressure on me. She bridges the gap between me and my kids. So I want to make sure I note that my wife has been an absolute rock in keeping that together. That's good to hear. Um, you say that your party has overcome many hurdles mm -hmm. in the recent past. Do, do, you, do you want to unpack that for us? What hurdles have you overcome? Well, the big one is finding the right people to be on the team. So politics creates opportunity, creates op there's, there's opportunists in politics. Right, so there there's learnings that are, um, that are sometimes expensive, I should say, uh, that you learn along the way. And then knowing who's who, you know, are they, are they in for the right reasons? Are they working for the right reasons? Are they motivated uh, by the real change we're trying to deliver? Uh, some come from entities that are questionable, some come with different motives. So we're always working through this. And in some cases, uh, you win, in some cases you lose those, but we go through a process and we really created, I believe, a very good process of vetting people uh, that are coming in and making sure that uh, work is done before it just goes straight to a national level, that we're seeing that you know, there's, there's, um, the cause is correct. Uh, no one in our, in our party takes any um, payroll or money. No one, not including myself. So I know I see people saying this, no one takes is on payroll. We don't have a payroll department. Mm. Yeah, only thing we cover is just expenses for party expenses. And because we have a limited budget, because we're not, we don't have, you know, as, a, as a news, fake news is, uh, is alluded to, you know, millions and millions of dollars mm -hmm. sitting around. Um, this is a shoestring budget. Mm -hmm. And these are people uh, that are working because they really believe in change. No one is taking any payroll. There's no, uh, there's no holiday. There's no vacation. Mm -hmm. And so uh, for us, um, those are, that was the biggest hurdle was being able to have the right team, in the right, having the right people in the right seats being able to deliver the right results, uh, including myself, because they were doubting me too, right? So they're also interviewing me as I'm interviewing them. Uh, so we had to make sure that was there. The second part is, you know, we have to be very careful not to become 
uh, an activist organization. We are a political party pushing a political agenda, clearly aware of the environment we're in. And our job is to show that we're solution oriented to the people. We, take gov we get into office and we take, and we take the charge and take the lead in government, uh, at, at, say, you know, September, August of 2023. We're still going to have economic sanctions in this country. So we are showing that we can solve problems in environments that are tough and difficult instead of being posting these things up. So when, when people are saying, how come you're having your events and so forth, we've applied for them in the measures they've given, given us and in the timeframes they've allowed us to do it. And we do get denied the same way every other yeah, party does. Denied. We have been. I was, last Friday, I was supposed to be in Wangay and that was denied. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had uh, one in another province that was denied. We continue moving. So if they deny us in one area, we were applying another area. If they, and then we just ask people to transport to that area. If they were denied in one area, we just continually move around. But strategically, we know that from you know laws of probability, we might get turned down X number of times. Let's apply X number of times. So the meeting still happens. And we continue to move. move and you don't way. make noise about not being allowed. We're to a political right? party pushing a political agenda. That's it. That's it. We know the environment we're in. We know it's toxic. We know it's polarized. We know it's against us. We know it's rigged. We know it's unfair. What's That's your it. campaign strategy? Are you giving out T-shirts? Because if you are, I'm, I'm going to be attending the next rally. <laughs> we are. We are. Uh, we are uh, giving out T-shirts. We are. You know, people are asking for them. You are bribing people to attend your rally by, <laughs> by giving them T-shirts. If, if, if they're bribed by a $3 t-shirt, I think uh, we're not really focused on the right things we want for this country. Right. Uh, but the people are asking for t-shirts. They want to be seen that they're supporting us. Um, you know, again, we're on a limited budget. And so we said, you know, do we go down the Regalia Road? It's a very expensive, you know, exp uh, it's a big line of expense. And we said, no, let's focus on, if we're going to do anything, let's maybe do something in the community that out outlives the election, uh, election cycle. So, uh, but people have asked for them and uh, the pressure has come from leadership. So we said, fine, let's, uh, let's get a good quote and let's make sure that our colors are right. And so we do have them. If you want, I'll, I've, I've asked if since we're doing regalia, I'm going to ask for a nice, I love golf. I'm going to ask for a nice golf shirt. I'll give you one. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking, I'm looking, Robert, for a Zanopi of t-shirt, CC t-shirt and your t-shirt. And um, I'll have uh, weekend dressing, you know, you, <laughs> um, you know, the, the, other issue, uh, Robert, they're saying that um, you pay, you're being paid to do all this stuff. And I, I, I look and say, this man has been the senior vice president of hospitals and health systems. He's been the vice president of RCM hospitals and physician groups. He's been the vice president of a private uh, equity firm. You, you, need, you must have a bit of changes lying around for you not to be bought. It's a tricky question to answer because, you know, when you think of um, sort of uh, society's version of what, what a lot of money is or what, what wealth is, um, yes, we would qualify. I would qualify in, in, um, in, in a global standard or society standard as, as someone that lives a very comfortable life. Uh, I do. I mean, uh, fly planes for hobby, uh, you know, all this sort of You have thing. a private jet. No, no, I don't. Um, I you, don't. You, 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 you fly other, you, you, you rent higher? Yeah, you can rent higher, um, uh, but uh, because of the campaign and, um, and the costs of that, um, some of those luxuries, I had to table them temporarily to really put them, to redirect that money to what we're trying to do here on the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, you know, typically vacation, probably every other month in a foreign country. Yeah, so I love to travel. I love to experience. So, um, from a comfortable lifestyle standpoint, uh, yes, uh, extremely, extremely comfortable. So, so, why are you doing this if you're so comfortable? I love my country. Um, there's, there's no way. I don't think if I look back on my life uh, in my later years, and I see and see what I've seen, and talk to people the way I've talked to them, uh, and engage in even in my own community in, in Chinoy. Um, I don't think I could comfortably say I've lived a fulfilling life if I didn't try to change and really work hard to either change the conversation or change the uh, political system in this country. We're not going anywhere. I don't think I could comfortably retire knowing that I, I didn't do anything. At some point, we got to get beyond charity and we really got to fix the root of the problem. And, that, and that's, for me, that's, that's where it's at. I, I get you 100%. The love for the country, um, the love to do something mm -hmm. uh, is part of uh, your purpose. Um, I, I've been there, 
um, Robert. And um, there's a sense where one guests, you know, a friend of mine says, Zimbabweans have not suffered enough to make the right choices. Mm-hmm. Gosana Moyo, who sat where you've uh, sat, uh, his view was where you're sitting right now, rather. And Gosana's view was, I've got the CV for what they need to be fixed. Mm-hmm. But they didn't look at the CV. No. Nope. I don't know what they're looking for. <laughs> so as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to be a bit harsh. And sound absolutely harsh. The Bavans haven't suffered enough. If they had, they would look for the right person to fix this country. Yeah. Do you think they get what you're trying to do? I don't think they do to some degree. I think people see that there is, um, there is a problem. And let, let me say this very quickly. I love Dr. Kosana Moyo. Brilliant man. If I, if you could ever give me time, I would love to just have an afternoon where we just sit and enjoy. Uh, very very wise man, and um, including him and many other uh, candidates that present themselves that have a fantastic global uh, resume that can really take this country forward. We have missed the opportunity to be led by 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 great and great and accomplished individuals of integrity. And so, when I look at our campaign. And what we're now, you know, coming through, and it's motivating to see how he ran his. He 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 said, you know what? I'm going to get off, leave my comfortable lifestyle, and come into this race, and let's try to change this. And but motiv- how are you going to change them, Robert, into seeing that they need to find the right person, not the person who draws rallies and and rabble rouses, but somebody who understands the issues, yes. somebody who's got the experience. How are you going to keep them there? Oh, that's going to be a little bit easy now uh, than compared to when Dr. Kusanamoyo, because today we are informed. This issue of like corruption is now double-sided. Mm-hmm. So no one can talk, of, they can't really say they're going to fight corruption if they're eating the, the same table. Mm-hmm. So as we go around the country, we're going to ask them to start questioning their leaders because that information is now readily available. We're really going to uh, attack this in a way that um, provokes the citizens to take, to take action. We're not going to be shy about it. We're not trying to uh, create sort of, um, you know, be friends through this process. The, enough is enough. So the citizens have to come in. Now, the question you asked before is, that have, have they suffered enough? Mm. We're seeing attacks on our side that are not coming from, we know there's a big battle up ahead, but we knew where the first one was going to be. And we decided not to spend too much energy on it because that's not really where the fight is. But it was interesting to see that most of the attacks are coming from what's considered as the alternative which looks, if I was to read some of the messages from them and not tell you who it was, mm. people would assume it's you know, either coming from, say, ZANO PF, but it's not, it's coming from uh, CCC, and they have not came out and said, you know, we're not part of this entity. So for us, it shows that people are not really paying attention to the issues on the ground. But I will be honest to say that people are responding to our message much greater than we initially expected. Mm. The numbers are much larger and uh, people are coming and saying, what can I do? What can we, how can we get involved? Uh, you know, what can I do in my, in my place? And the only thing I can say is register to vote and, and start questioning your counselor and your MPs immediately. Mm-hmm. And if they took money that belonged to taxpayers, you need to replace them. Mm-hmm. Is it true that uh, Dr. Nkosana Moyo's uh, former outfit, uh, APA, has endorsed you? The Alliance uh- for the People's Agenda? They released a statement, uh, which I was uh, very pleased. They released it right the day after our press conference. And they said, uh, I know that they're fielding their candidates uh, where they are. There is a, I wouldn't call it, say, a coalition, but they came and said, we're endorsing uh, Robert Chapman uh, for, um, uh, for president. But they will continue to field their candidates as, uh, under, the, um, under the APA brand mm-hmm. uh, that's there. And so uh, I was very pleased that they did that. And, and we see eye to eye on the same issues in the country. So it was very encouraging to see them do that. Robert, talk to me about, you, you've been on the campaign trail. Talk to me about the one thing that you've come across that has broken your heart, that has pulled your heartstrings. One, two, talk to me about something that you've come across the campaign trail that has lifted your spirits. Well, um, I don't know that I can pick one that's broken my heart. Uh, because we see uh, youth uh, that are, you know, unemployed, on drugs, really giving up hope. Um, we, and, and not all of them are on drugs, but it becomes, that's the direction they start going towards. On the other side, you see our senior citizens and our elderly that have worked their entire life. Some of them still from the Rhodesian government and went through independence with huge, tremendous hope. And, and you see them just um, 
completely broken and living in poverty. Uh, that one is, is very, very hard uh, to see uh, because I can relate to that with my family, with my grandmother. Um, so uh, that one's very, very tough. I, let me share a quick story with you if we have time. Sure, uh, so we were a uh, few, uh, about six weeks ago, we were driving to Mtare and we stopped, um, <clears throat> I think it's like in Marondera, right past that, but there's an area right there, like a growth point where there's like a chicken in Baker's. Yeah. Area. And so we stopped there to get some food. Um, you know, and a young guy came up, we have, you know, convoy of cars, a young kid is about 15 years old, comes up and says, can I, and I'm standing in line to order food with my team. And he said, can I clean the tires on your car? And I laughed and I said, you don't have to clean the tires on my, on that car. That's not my car. We just rent those, you know? And I said, but, um, you know, what, you know, what do you need? And he said, well, I want to get something to eat. I said, well, just order what you want. I'll, I'll, I'll pay for, I'll get it for you. So he ordered, uh, like a three piece chicken and chips. We sit down. He went, walked outside and we sat at the table. So I went out and said, no, come, come, come sit with us. So he came, sat down and said, tell me your name, engaging with them. He's a 15 year old boy that is cleaning uh, passerby's tires, making, he's just carrying a bucket and a, and a rag. And he's taking care of his grandmother and his younger sister because his mother is in Botswana trying to buy secondhand clothes so she can come back and sell. And it broke my heart. Because he took a piece of chicken, put it in a napkin, put it in his pocket, and I asked him what he was doing. He said, I'm going to take this back to my grandmother. Wow. So we have children in this country that are taking care of families. Mm -hmm. And we see what we see in, in the level of corruption and the um, mispenditure of money and, and state funds and the looting of natural resources in, in, in this country. And we are focused on personalities. I think we're a little lost. Now, the p uplifting part yeah. of that is those same people are still happy to see you. They still want to hug you, encourage you, and they're so thankful that you bring a different message. And you're, and again, you're at the front taking the fight. And that's what encourages. That's the fuel that we have to continue moving forward. To see the way Bulawayo responded to us over the weekend, and to see the way Mashingo responded to us on Sunday which is absolutely encouraging. It shows that the numbers are there. The people do understand that the message of hope that has been peddled for the last 10 years is really not hope, that they needed something. While they might have been saying we need an alternative, they wanted a different alternative that was there. And we're really talking about the issues that matter on the ground. Robert, I'm talking to you right now. I get the sense I'm talking to a human being. I feel the emotion. I feel the, the, the emotion that you're expressing right now. I see it on your face. <laughs> uh, we need politicians like that. We don't have them. Robert, when we come back, we're going to take a break. When we come back, I'm going to ask you what your views on sanctions are okay. and the land issue. And also to ask you, Robert, um, what happens if you lose? <laughs> Interesting question. Yes. Uh, don't go away. Join us after this short break for my conversation with Robert Chapman, the presidential candidate for the Democratic Union of Zimbabwe. I am against the, the, the idea that sanctions do exist on the country and affect the people. But if there are people that are doing, that cause threat to another country or doing illicit things that affect another country, that country has the right to put sanctions on individuals or, or private companies. But when they're state institutions, uh, then we have a problem. Imagine getting free access to the Newsday, The Standard, The Zimbabwe Independent, and The Weekly Digest for a full month. Well, you can, and all you need to do is download the Newsday e-reader app on Google Play Store or scan the Newsday QR code in any of the AMH print publications and start enjoying the quality content. Welcome back to our conversation with uh, Robert Chapman, the presidential candidate for the Democratic Union of uh, Zimbabwe. Robert, you were born in Chinoy, often at a very early age, am I right? Uh, yes, I was born in Harare, in, Harare. In, raised in Chinoy. Okay. Yes, sir. And um, talk to me about your upbringing. And I want for us to bring out the things that are your upbringing that has had an impact on the person that you have become. You were raised by your grandmother? 
Yes. What else? So, um, you know, born in Harare, um, my parents uh, both died in a car accident um, four days before I'm Christmas. I'm so sorry to hear that. I wasn't aware of that. Thank you. Yeah, they both died uh, at the same time, um, on the same day, uh, right before my third birthday. Uh, so about uh, uh, 10 days before my third birthday. So they passed away. I believe the family was getting together for Christmas. And Your mother was black. Zimbabwean, yes. Or your father, white. White, yes, okay. British. British, okay. Yes, and he was uh, working in the mines uh, here uh, in the early days, and they, they met and fell in love, had, uh, had two kids, um, but they passed away very early on. So I don't have much recollection of my, uh, besides just seeing pictures, I don't have much recollection. I was, you know, right before my third birthday. So, you know, we, I believe at the time we lived in Bindura, um, and then we moved to Chinoy, obviously, after my parents passed away. My uh, grandmother and my grandfather took uh, responsibility for my sister and I. Go go. What's, go, go. what's Gogo's name? I'm Guyon Gany. 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 I'm Guyon yeah, but in the watch or change about the whole Murias and the Jacques and Murias, even in Momo Muniani, community, yes, I had to change it. Tato Zikano, even in Nastica and Dago, I don't know Zio, under the Gamcha Raganaka, they will know that Mona Messi, they'll know Mona Messi, eh, Mona Messi, even Gumsika. I go to him every time I never could know, never know Zika, they want to turn Zia. But and and so Gani raises you. Talk to me about what being orphaned early at that age mm -hmm. and being raised by Ambiam Gani, what that has done to you in the first instance, and secondly. Are there any scars that you carry around? Um, you know, my grandmother is extremely loving. Anyone that knows her, most people do. So she was uh, at Chinoy High School since 1964 to about 2004. So she has taken care of many she was a children. Teacher. She was a, a matron in the hostel. Yeah, so a lot of people know her. Uh, in fact, I believe at one point, she's, her pictures were circulated through uh, Facebook when people run into her. They take pictures with her. My grandfather is also very well known. Uh, in Chinoy, he founded the first, uh, built the first black non-mission school in the location, mm -hmm. which is Chinoy Primary. Mm -hmm. And there's a story behind that for another time. But uh, both of them have served the community extremely well. Uh, I grew up, my grandmother taking care of other kids that were not very privileged. So people would live in and out of the house mm -hmm. as well. They'll come and go, come and go. And I would ask, who's this, who's this you're bringing here now? And she would say, oh, you don't have money to go home, so they're going to stay here for the, you know, we have, you know, three week, three months boarding school, one month off, three months, you know, all year round school. You say it was a poor upbringing. Yes. Describe to me what it was like. Uh, very, very poor. We never owned a car. Uh, never owned a, owned, and never, we never owned a car. We didn't even have a telephone. Mm -hmm. So when family would phone from, uh, from the UK, the neighbors would uh, answer, they would call the neighbor's house. And then they would, uh, someone from there would run and say, ah, you, you have a phone call from London. Then my grandmother would run uh, there and answer the phone. Um, the home was, is a you know, typical location home, four, four roomed house, bathroom outside, uh, built the house. I remember one time uh, we, my grandmother and my grandfather ex extended their house because now they have you know, children where they, thought, they didn't think they would, right, in their, in their elderly years. And they expanded it and the house would rain and water would come through the ceiling. And at one point I climbed up there and they'll tell me the hole, the holes here and I would put putty while it was raining. It was the only way to know where the roof was leaking. <laughs> yeah. Did, so, you, did you ever go to bed without a meal? Yes. Yeah. No power, uh, no food. Um, I ran barefoot most of the time. Uh, I wanted to say like it was, it was dirt poor, but I didn't know any different because um, there was a lot of love in our house. My grandmother is extremely loving. Uh, a lot, a lot of love in the house. And my grandfather. And any siblings? Yes, I have a sister. You have a sister. Where is your sister now? She's in the United States. She's in the United States. Yes. And um, what was the break that got you out of that poverty? Uh, you know, being hardworking, you know, we would, we always, you know, in, in Zimbabwe, a lot of people have, you know, small plots of places where they, they either rent and, they, and they, they plant items. So hard work was, um, I knew, I, it wasn't an issue of, of hard work. So my family has always been hardworking. My aunts, my mother's sisters, had um, all moved to, to the UK, uh, either for college or for work, and, 
And you know, that's sort of your like mother's sister, my mother's sisters. Okay. And so they were, they, uh, as I said, the whole family took care of us. They would take my sister and I, when I finished high school, they, they, uh, they said, come to the UK. And I went to university in, in London. Um, the difference uh, in sort of what changed for me is I realized, especially when after uh, college and I went to the United States, was if you applied hard work in a functional environment, you could succeed, which is why I love free enterprise. Because it's based on the effort that I put in, how productive and effective I am, and who I surround myself with. And so I discovered that very quickly in the United States, the environment is working, which is why it's easy for me to pinpoint what's not working here. Because I've been in an environment where I only showed up with one suitcase, right? When I moved from, from college, from England to uh, the United States, I had one suitcase. I started working uh, in a grocery store as a, as a deli slicer, uh, you know, making $5 an hour to the point where, where we are now. So um, hard work paid off and you, you could fail in that environment and it wasn't fatal. If you try here and fail, it's fatal. You lose everything. Mm. So, but you, you say you had your first business at 16. Yes. What is that? Is that true? It is true. Okay. Yes. Well, what was that? It was, was a car magazine. Or no, <laughs> car magazine. All right. Yes. Um, I, I love cars. Um, not as much now as I did back then. I love, at 16 years old. At 16 years old. Cars. In London. Yeah, in London. And so uh, I would go around and go to different car dealerships and take pictures of the cars and write about them mm -hmm. and, and started putting a car magazine together. Uh, a lot of big, huge mistakes, had our first print and then realized um, you have to sell the magazine to pay off the print. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the real world. <laughs> yeah, crash and burn on that one. Yeah, yeah so uh, that was the first experience of, um, of, of, uh, of you know, entrepreneurial pay. <laughs> and and let, let's go now to real uh, heavy lifting stuff. Like I said before we took the break, what view do you take of sanctions? against Zimbabwe? You know, sanctions um, are, are sort of two-sided. There's, um, and I think I heard Atam Tambara mention it, which I thought was brilliantly put. Uh, he said, you know, there's two types of sanctions. The sanctions we put on ourselves and sanctions other people put on us. And so we can spend a lot of time looking at what uh, the United States or the EU or, or Great Britain sanctions they put on Zimbabwe. Uh, and we can look at us. But if we're talking about the sanctions that they're putting, we cannot really spend too much time trying to influence or try to fight that because they make that decision in their own house, right? So if they come and say, we don't want to, we want to put sanctions on Zimbabwe, we have to ask ourselves, you know, one is why. For me, when I go down and start looking at the, at the Zadera sanctions, I'm looking at the individuals on the list and the entities on the list. The individuals can be sanctioned by anyone. You know, we can decide Zimbabwe as a, as a country to sanction particular individuals that we feel could be a threat to our own national security. And we make that decision consciously. Uh, that individual can't do anything about it besides proving that they shouldn't be on that list and eventually come off. Uh, but when you start sanctioning state institutions, that's a real problem because that affects the um, performance of that institution. And so we can either choose to reform it uh, based on what the, you know what's there, or we can choose to ignore that and work around those sanctions. But I am against the 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 idea that sanctions do exist in the country and affect the people. But if there are people that are doing, that cause threat to another country or doing illicit things that affect another country, that country has a right to put sanctions on individuals mm -hmm. or, or private companies. But when they're state institutions, uh, then we have a problem because that affects the, and for me, the biggest one is the uh, Zimbabwe Defense Forces. Mm -hmm. When I see, you know, national security entity on a sanctions list, that leaves us open, makes us vulnerable as, as a nation. That, that's a real problem. We create the perception that we don't seem to have a handle on our economic policy. What view do you take about land? Should we have a land audit? Should land be given back to uh, the previous white owners? Should they be compensated? What, where, where do you stand? Uh, this idea of holding on, of saying, you know, you didn't fight the liberation struggle. I think we're in another one, in, in a modern day one, an economic one uh, in this country that is imposed by a different type of regime.